Good evening, and welcome everyone to Roleplay Theory. I am Stendar. We're joined by Casey Blake. And, Hello, uh, Internet. We're going to talk a little bit today. We're starting a new project. We're going to be playing. A, this is our roleplay channel, and we're going to be playing. Uh, we're going to be playing Stars Without Number. So this is. Um, well, Casey, I'll let you take over. Let's yeah. So, uh, I have this friend, and he's an old Vietnam vet. His name is John Smith, and I was, we were just in the car, um, a 45-minute car ride up to Joplin and back, and we were talking about, I was trying to explain to him why I play role-playing games and what I like about them, and we started talking about D&D because that's the one that everyone's heard of, and I got to telling him about the other games that I was playing at the time, which were... Um, Dungeon World and Mouse Guard. And he responds to me that when he was my age, he was super into sci fi. He read Dune. He listed like 10 other sci fi authors that I'd never heard of. Um, I'll try and get that list from him next time I see him. But having heard everything that he said, I thought. John Smith, would you like to play a role-playing game with me? We'll do science fiction. I've never dungeon mastered or game mastered or master of ceremonies a sci-fi game before, but I have this game in mind that I'd like to play, and if you're into sci-fi, and we can maybe get a group together and play Stars Without Number. And he said, yeah, that sounds awesome. I would love to do that. So... We go through our day in Joplin and we're talking back and forth about all kinds of stuff. But when I got home that night, I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make a sector. And, you know, I've watched Adam Coble's GM turns and I watched every episode of Swan Song. And I'm a big fan of It Me JP and all of their work. So. I had some basic ideas about what I would do when I had a sector in my hands. So I went to, um, are you showing the website that we got the... Yeah, we got the hexes these... out. Okay, cool. So this was the sector generator that I got. Um, and it's available online, super easy. And the seed that I used to generate this, if any of you want to generate it for your own use while we go through this, was um, all capitals K C B L A K E. I type that into the seed, and it brings up this sector. So before so, before we jump into talking about the sector map too much, give me a let's give our viewers who've never heard of Stars Without Numbers before a little uh, little backstory on kind of what oh. the, the setting of the world is before we jump into uh, our sector map here. Yeah 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 yeah. Um, I actually have my boiled down version of the timeline written down right here in my notebook. What page was that on? Here we go. So in 2108, the spike drive is invented. Uh, 2113, the first habitable oxygenated planet is discovered. 2150, Alien ruins are found on the moon Typhoon, and the primordial ooze planet is found on an ocean world um, that I can't pronounce. Pranashakti. 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 Um, by, by 2240, so 232 years after people first start using spike drives, um, human children start being born with multi-dimensional extroversion syndrome which lets them pull the powers from other dimensions into our dimension and do telepathy and do telekinesis and teleport themselves and other things and that's fine except the more they use it the more they burn up their brains so you know sometimes Maybe you can use telekinesis 12 times before your brain is burnt out and you either die or go completely insane. So, you know, that's scary. Um, 
So within 35 years of that, uh, the psychic training programs are founded. They start training psychics how to use their powers without burning up parts of their brain that are important. They burn up, you know, empty spots where the brain isn't really doing anything. So, yay. Um, with these psychic training programs, uh, the jump gates get invented. These psychic telepaths, no, the teleporters, um, they power up this huge jump gate that they can use to send bigger ships across huge reaches of space without using a spike drive and it's instantaneous because a spike drive you know it would let you get from the sun to the next star over in a week instead of 400 years or however the heck long it takes to get there probably a thousand years I don't even know um, where this jump drive lets them do it almost instantaneously so they the huge wave of human expansion spreads out across the universe again um, by 2450 most worlds have jump gates um, then this is my little side note uh, 2540 uh, the first jump is made into Hades Theta which is the name of our sector here um, 2540 so then 115 125 years later 2665 the scream happens a horrible psychic multi-dimensional phenomenon uh, echoes throughout the whole universe instantly kills every psychic in existence um, thousands of worlds are left without the ability since their jump gate is down if they're importing food through their jump gate well now their jump gates down and they just have to starve to death um, Millions of worlds are lost, never to be heard from again. Um, huge sectors of space are cut off from each other. And this is going to be the story of one of those sectors. Hades Theta had two jump gates, both of which no longer function. And there's billions of inhabitants in this sector that have spike drives still and are jumping from planet to planet and trying to make it work um, but a lot of their really awesome psychically fueled technology no longer functions and the psychics still exist in this world because it's been uh, 600 almost 600 years what's that 535 years since the scream and in those 535 years, the spike drive has come back into popularity, and now there are lots of psychics being born from uh, coming in and out of multidimensional space. So, yeah, that's that's sort of the yeah, that's kind of the scoop. That's kind of the backstory yeah. that will set up what we're about to talk about here. Uh, right. So let's talk so, about the sector map. Well, okay. Well, where That's you want cool. to where you want to start? Yeah, so I got I I got online and and I generated the sector, and like just click on Amaviska because that was the first one that I clicked on. Right. Okay. You know, I'm looking at the sector and I'm like, okay, that's a lot of star systems, and a lot of planets, and it's kind of overwhelming. So let's just go through. So I click on Amaviska and scroll down here, and this planet has psionic sphere and area 51, and I'm like, all right, well. What does that mean? So I look in the book, and in the book towards the back, it tells you Area 51 means that most of the population of this planet either doesn't know that there are other human beings in outer space that they could talk to. Um, they're kept totally in the dark by their government, and the government has a facility that takes care of you know, importing and exporting extraterrestrial things sort of um, like our area 51 yeah like like if area 51 on earth is what all the conspiracy theorists think it is right yeah you know, i don't know i'm one of the normal sheep that are kept in the dark about that kind of thing <laughs> and that's fine right so then i look at the psionic sphere tag and i'm like well what am i going to do with that um maybe here you go 
one of their exports are teenagers that start showing psychic promise the you know the men in black organization goes and rounds them up and takes them to area 51 and ships them out into outer space go be someone else's problem we can't have you here on our planet making problems for us um so yeah i go through i went through each one of these planets and just looked at it and I wrote it down in my notebook, you know, the planet and their tags and what about it I thought would be important or, you know, if not important, then, you know, interesting. Something that I can tell my players about this planet that is interesting. Because if it's not interesting, then I don't want to care about then, it. Then who cares? Right. That's, that's the just, whole point that we're playing these games because they're right. interesting. Right. So, you know, I go through this whole huge list um what was another one that i had sauna yeah bring up sauna got it um you know i looked at sauna's tags and i'm like what this is a tech level five the highest technology tier that there is planet and they have zombies how the heck am i gonna make this work so again i go and look in the back of the book um, or I guess in the middle of the book where it has the zombies tag. And I'm like, okay, that, you know, that makes sense. And then in the very back of the book, there's an example planet that is a high technology planet that has a zombie problem. And I'm like, okay, this is perfect. I'm going to, I'm going to say that this is a space station. Um, they took, uh, you know, the space station, be, when the scream happened, they had to take 90% of their population and put them in cryostasis, sleep, pods, whatever. Um, and then the other 10% of the population was left awake to carry on. You know, they have hydroponic facilities. They can grow their own food. They can support themselves and do maintenance on this facility where all of these people are stuck in cryostasis and maintain their cryostasis. And then, you know, after 600 years of being stuck in cryosleep, they start getting weird report, weird readouts from these machines. Um, no big deal, I guess, you know, I don't know. There's weird readouts coming from these people that are supposed to be, you know, maybe not cryogenically frozen. But pretty but, much brain dead. Right, in some kind of... Deep sleep. Yeah, prolonged, prolonged life state. Right, right. Um... So I just sort of pocketed that. I don't know why they're becoming zombies, but for some reason these people are becoming zombies, and I don't know if they're waking up and breaking out of their things, or if the people are afraid that there's something wrong with them and they're going to try and start waking them up to find out what's going on. So that was just where I left that. Um, I went on later, and this is probably a week of thinking about this every day um jump into the alien races and click on the ohm lang real quick real quick before we go in there um, okay how we decided that it was a space station was that if you look at this tab here it has atmosphere which tells us that the planet itself has no air it has no atmosphere so they can't be on the planet unless they're in bubble cities and you know we found that we had a, we had another planet that had bubble cities in the tag so we didn't feel like doing that again. So we decided, you know, let's make it a space station. That's fun. That's fun for zombies. It brings yeah. in, like, Pandorum and all those kind of feelings. And the fact that you're trapped in space with zombies, you know, that you really can't <laughs> run away from that. That's kind of awesome. You know? Mm -hmm. So that's how we can grab that. So when you're looking at this tag, and the tags are important. They give you the flavor. But the the setting is all in the atmosphere, the temperature, the biosphere you know how many people are there tens of thousands because if it said billions we can't really i mean we could make a big big space station but then you're talking about like new york city sized space station so because it's tens of thousands it totally fits that um the idea that yeah this is a space station there's there's tens of thousands of people on there there could be you know fifty thousand people up there and that's still a really huge space station but it works because if it said millions of people now granted these are just guidelines to help you get along but like I really like I really like using them and that like helps set it up for you know the scenario so you can use all of these all of these tabs as a uh, a guiding hand to help you kind of define the storyline on each one of these planets 
Right. Exactly. Um, I've never done anything like this before. Right. And I made, you know, Dungeons and Dragons campaigns that had factions and right. Apocalypse World talks about factions or fronts, not factions, fronts. fronts. Um, I'd made fronts before, but this is very different. Um, right. I've never done prep like this where it's been two weeks or three weeks since I generated this sector. Does it say that at the top? Uh, um, it's created September 17th, 2016. Yeah, no, it's and it's September 26th. Yep, it's almost been a week. So yeah, it's it's been almost 10 days. Right. You created this um, on my birthday. That I've been just thinking about this and I'm at work doing my job and somewhere in my brain I'm thinking about this prep that I'm doing and I've never done prep like that but this this game in particular um, it's very prep heavy right. lonely fun at the, lonely at the fun. very beginning it's, it's prep heavy before you get started and then once you have all that done You're I good. hope right. I, I won't yet. feel I won't have to feel this prep pressure and I can just do an hour or two of prep and the day before my session and know exactly what's going on everywhere in the universe. Exactly. And that's um, what the faction turn is all about, which we'll right. go into a little more detail about that. But the way I see it is that, you know, we've created a story, something interesting, something worth talking about on every one of these planets. Something, yeah. you know, something that if the players showed up, we don't have to try to drum something up. We have something worth talking about on every planet. That could become massive scenarios that could play out in huge intergalactic battles, possibly. You never know. Right. But right now, everything's kind of balanced. Oh, yes. Side note. I created this on your computer on your birthday because I was at your house on your birthday. Ah. I created this for the first time. At least a week before that, right? So we're looking. So I've, at it's probably been fifteen or twenty days right. that we that I've just been muddling doing around, prep, through. right? Learning, learning as we go. Um, so anyway, yeah. where are we headed? Um, Do I, I guess let's, let's talk about. So I get my players together. I get my buddy John Smith first. Okay. Um, and we're talking about what kind of character he wants to play, and he wants to be essentially a white American um, but he's very much into Native American culture he's a white buffalo whatever that means so he I don't even know what tribe you know he goes to Sundance every year and is a drum Keep. or drum whatever they're called so yeah I mean he's real big into this Native American culture and then he, he wants to be an ex-mercenary. And I'm like, all right, well, tell me about this mercenary group. And he goes, I think they're a bunch of Russians. I'm like, all right. So I got the I, – so I know there are Russians and Americans and he's interested in one of the other people that was – one of the, like his best mercenary brother was this Native American that gave him this Indian name that is his name that his Native American brothers call him. And I'm like, all right, cool, awesome. Uh, yeah, so I'm just taking notes as he's telling me about what kind of character he wants to play. And in a universe this big, I can't say no. Whatever you're in, whatever my players are into, yeah, I'm down. I can fit it somewhere in this universe that I have in front of me. Um, so, and we'll get we'll get more into that. As the I didn't start talking to the other players for like a week after that, um, but yeah, I got him involved and uh, open up diode diode genes. Was that the planet? No, dang it, dynamine. That's the planet. I know mean. So I open up dynamine and I'm like, all right. So I got a breathable atmosphere cold planet with no native life there's hundreds of thousands of inhabitants tech level four perimeter agency minimal contact let's real quick real quick let's talk about uh -huh. the tech levels okay so you got tech level zero which is caveman stone age 
tech level one is medieval technology. Um, in my mind, I imagine that everywhere from, you know, Roman aqueducts up to catapults, castles, and chivalry. Right, like pre steam engine. Right. You know what I mean? They they don't even have steam engines. No, no, it's, it's got to be all. But yeah, none of that. Windmills. They have windmills. Right. Do they maybe have black powder rifles? No. Maybe depends on the planet. You know what I mean? Maybe, but um, most of the time, I would say no. Right. So then, um, level two. Tech level two. Um, what's Nin the tag on tech level 19th two? Nineteenth century technology. Nineteenth century technology. That's what it says. Um, yeah, we're looking at steam engines steam now. Steam engines. We're looking at Revolutionary War. We're black, looking at river boats. Right, right black powder um, rifles. Definitely black powder rifles excuse for sure. Me, excuse me. Um, then we have tech level three, which is today basically the world that I'm sitting in right now. We right. live in a tech level three world. Yeah. Um, it extends a little bit beyond what we can what do. we have today. Just a little bit. Um, but you not, know, you know, we're not it, making spaceships. What will, what will America look like in fifty years? What will Japan right. look like in fifty years? Um, what will China look like in fifty years? Mm -hmm. You know, the technologically advanced J part of J China, not the Japan, third world. Japan will look like China. what America will look like in. Japan will look so? like in fifty years. What America will look like in sixty years. Bah. Bah. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, so that, that's tech, level tech level three. five is or tech level four. Sorry, go ahead. Then, so tech level four, we're looking at the common what most people in sector Hades Theta are going to have access to: um, spaceships, faster than light travel, um, robots, and laser blasters, and that kind of stuff. Very, right. it's, you know, your low level sci fi stuff. Right. Um, and then tech level five is the golden age tech that existed before the screen. Right. Um, psionic jump gates are tech level five. Um, artificial intelligence and uh, nanobots is all tech level five. Um, you know, there were lots of psionic based factories where they were able to use materials that don't happen in nature because psionics could adjust their molecular structure in ways that don't occur naturally. Um, so, unobtainium. Right. You know what I mean? The right, right. psionics could take, I'm going to take your lead and your plastic and make unobtainium out of it or whatever. Right, right. Um, so that's all tech level five stuff that is either extremely rare in, in this current in, in Hades Theta, at least, um, there are two planets that have access to Tech Level 5, and then I think two planets that have what's it's called Tech Level 4 Plus, which means they have like one thing yeah, that limited, they're good at making better. Limited access. Uh, close to Tech Level 5. I think there's um, two, if maybe three, Tech Level um, if 5 you go locations. To the, planetary directory and click on tech level at the top it'll put them in order um uh, yeah there's two with the tech level four plus right which is and one of them is those they're both in the same location a same so, a solar system one of them is the uh the zombies space station right. And, right. The, and the other one is uh well there's the digital this yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the sector map and just talk about... Um, I think this is a good place to go next. So I have this other Tech Level 5 planet. Those were the two planets I decided to start at because they're both um, Tech Level 5. Right. So I, I looked at the Badria uh, Sana planet, and they got zombies and they got problems. So they're probably not a big sector-wide regional hedge mong, and we'll get into factions later. Yeah, we'll talk about so what I, that means. I come back and I look at Tornik Yodis in uh, the Adoni 
hex. Um, do you have that up? I do. So here I've got a totally uh, terraformed, probably, planet um, that has a colonized population, and they have access to forbidden technology, Maltech. Um, there's something here that if the rest of the sector knew what they were doing with their advanced technology, they would come and try to stop them from doing it. I don't know yet what that is. They might be creating unbraked artificial intelligences. They might be creating some kind of nanobot that, you know, with all good intentions is going to save human lives, but winds up turning every human being into food or gasoline or something weird. Um, I don't know yet what that's going to be, but they have some kind of forbidden tech going on this planet. So I'm like, all right, I think they have a jump gate. They have tech level five. The first, so I just decided, I make a decision. I am the space master of space. <laughs> the first jump gate in Hades Theta was built at Tornik Yotis. Cool. Awesome. Um, I decided later, when one of my players told me that she wanted to be from this planet, she's playing a biopsionic medic uh, character from this planet, and uh, she wants to be Russian. And I'm like, all right, so these these guys are Russian too. So the Russian spaceship Tornik Yotis flies through uh, Spike's uh, multidimensional space for however long it takes to get here from wherever they're from. And the colony lands on Tornik Yotis. They terraform the planet. They set up the jump gate. Um, the other planet in the Adoni sector is Mosteg. And Mosteg has tech level 4+. Plus. And I'm like, all right, so Mosteg definitely belongs to, to um, Tornik Yotis. So those two planets are the two most high-tech planets in my sector. Um, Mosteg is just a desert world. Uh, what's going on on this planet that I care about? So I look down. Um, they have freak geology. I don't really know what that means. Their biosphere is only microbial life, and they have no atmosphere. So maybe there's something there that the Tornik Yotis Russians are mining out of this desert. You know what I mean? Um, right. Yeah. I'm. I just. I just listened to Dune on audiobook, and I'm like, yeah, there's something on this desert that people care enough about to come and settle this sector. Maybe just for what's in this desert. I don't know for sure. Um, so from there, I'm like, all right. Well, what's the next sector up in 406? So I go into 406, and I look at this planet, and I'm like, okay, millions of inhabitants, warm, breathable. Um, they have a sealed menace and either misandry or misogyny. So what – maybe these guys belong to – are these more Russians that belong to the same people that settled the Adoni sector? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um I didn't know what to do with them at the time. Um, and I sort of went through the sector like that, just picking apart each individual planet and just looking at them to decide what right. was there and what about the more important. Checking out the tags, just getting a right. feel for the world and what has been generated there. Right. So, you know, and I, I went through this process the first time and just got down what was the most important to me about each planet. And then we went through it the second time on your birthday. We went through right. every single planet, and we sat up for several hours. I think it took six hours to go just, through just to create the, a faction for every planet that we justified interesting enough to have one. Because we found yeah. a couple Tech 2 Revolutionary War-ish style planets that um, were doing a couple things that didn't the tags didn't speak to us and say yeah this is a thing and they're doing stuff here it was just like right. oh, there's there's stuff going on here it's okay it's not that interesting 
If they land here, we'll come up with something for them, but it's not worth putting in the section, in the faction notes, because, you know, nothing was going on. But I swear, we put almost, we put something on almost every planet in this sector. And and that's going to be something that's up to my players. You know what I mean? I put, I made factions that I think are interesting. Right. If my players decide that the medieval people on Thorbjorg, in the Thorbjorg system or I guess 19th century, right. if they decide that the 19th century Xenoph- Cold War xenophobes <laughs> right. on this cold to temper- temperate planet are important to them, then that's where then we're going. Maybe they need a faction or two on that planet and to we'll, fight with each other. And we and, can make those changes as necessary. Right. Which is the, so, the beautiful thing about the, um, the uh, spreadsheet we're going to show you here in a little bit. Exactly. Exactly. Um... Now, for what it's worth, that six hours, we also watched that scary movie with your wife and did right. all the alien races. It took races. six hours because so, we chose to put in 22 factions. Something like that. If you if you feel like going over and taking a peek at Swan Song, which I very much recommend, um, I believe he has 15 factions. Yeah, maybe. I think at the, at the highest part. At the anyway, highest. The, the, so... We decided to go a little more. We want, well, like we said at the beginning, we wanted something. No matter where our players go, we wanted right. there to be something for us to talk about. All right. So, um, I guess yeah. Let's go look at the faction, um, faction tracker. What do you know? Here I am. Um. How do you have them organized? I have the. It starts with the brats of Krovi. So let's organize them by their force. How do, if you how just right click on the D and sort A to Z. Or actually sort Z to A. Yeah, I'm good. You know what I mean? You got it? Wait, wait oh, for Z to A. No, is it gonna work? Is it gonna work? Uh, so eight to one? Yeah. Okay. So Adoni Neogen Alliance is the first one on my list. Yes, it is. Okay, so what do you know? The Adoni Neogen Alliance is my regional hedgemong that belongs to the Adoni sector, which has the jump gate. It's my tech level five faction. And I'm like, awesome. I'm, that worked out perfectly. I didn't know they were our only force level eight category. So um, when it comes to factions, there's a whole section in the book about creating factions and we've talked Uh about the book a lot just so you know this book is a pdf it is free you can go to the website and download it there will be a link in the description for any of you who would like to obtain this book yes thank you brother yeah um Um, also for the uh, section map generator we'll have a link for that as well mm -hmm. um oh this factions sheet i got off of i think at, like this is the faction seat that Adam Coble used. I got it from him, uh, from either his Twitter or his Google Plus community. I'm not sure which. I got the actual Swan Song um, faction turn tracker and just cleared all the information out of it and built my own information into it, um, which was great for me. It's got the asset tables there on the first page. Um, it's got all the goals and tags and they're all, all the boxes are linked together and it's very well made. And once you start, once you've created something in the faction tracker, when you go over to the asset tracker and you type, start to type it, it'll pre-generate. So it's all connected. Um, again, there'll be a link in the description for you to find it. It's very helpful. It's been very useful for us. Oh, good, 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 good. So, and this was sort of the same process. I looked through my planets and i'm like all right well definitely the the uh, tornic yotis in adoni has a faction um it's probably one of the biggest most powerful factions in the sector so let's make a regional hedgemong there um they're they've got tech level five we're gonna give them a huge uh force rating i think they're the only one i have that has a capital fleet they're the only um, force high enough to have that. Yeah, tech level eight. They have a capital fleet. You know what I mean? They have, they have the power to change things in the sector when they put their muscle on it. Um, so, 
I go through. Um, I wish we just recorded that whole six-hour night, um, but that's just ridiculous. Right, that would have been long, that. but we'll get the equivalent um, of that over the next several episodes. Right. So I look at Actorius, which is 406 sector. Um, the only planet there uh, wound up becoming our sealed menace monk planet. Um, and I don't think they're a faction. I don't think... Like they have their own problem. They have their own thing that that planet is doing. I don't think they belong to the Adoni, Adoni Neogen Alliance. Um, Diogenes, Diogenes, however you want to say that. Um, that's up in 505 in Ain't Zane. That's an outpost world. Well, who owns this outpost? Well, let's give that to the Adonis. It's only, you know, one in, or two hexes away. They could, if they have a level two spike drive, they can get there in six days, bam, and handle this outpost. Um, so I go on. Uh, what's the next on the list, brother? Uh, syncretic Protestant pagans. Okay, so two hexes to the left of Adoni is Jala, where there's this weird planet that has millions of inhabitants. Pre-tech cultists and ancient ruins. And I'm like, all right, well, that's weird. Um, just north of that, there's a planet. I say north, up on the sector, I guess. Right. Um, there's another outpost world that has a theocracy. And I'm like, all right, this is this kind of makes sense. So I've got a theocracy that that exists in this outpost world, and then I've got another world that has a cult and ancient ruins um, maybe the outpost is belongs to these cultists um, the other one is over in Gaztain the other world that they own um, no not that one that one and it's Shania um, yes. no that's the yeah that one, that one. Um, no Shandia is the well, I mean Gold Rush. Yes, which is the one that they have, isn't it? Because, or are they uh -huh. in Sinassus? Nope, Sinassus. It's a tomb world, and it's tech level one. There's a bunch of people running around on this planet, hundreds of thousands of inhabitants running around with tech level one technology. And I'm like, all right, it's a tomb world, which means there was a lot of technology there before the scream, but either the scream happened and all the tech got shut off and these people have been living as you know medieval whatever that means what does that mean so uh maybe okay here you go the ruins are somehow connected to this tomb world the people on jala uh are somehow connected to this tomb world maybe they've sent missionaries there they have this other outpost world over in Midari, and they have these missionaries on this tomb world in Gaztain, and they're going to be uh, a sort of religious group. Um, and they're right next to my other regional hedgemong, so let's make them a really powerful religious group. So go back over to the sector, brother, and click on religions. Ah, yes. Um, so this go ahead. this was very useful when you generate your seed if you want to play this game when you generate your seed it will give you all of these religions um, and this is another list that was totally overwhelming to me when right. I looked at it because I don't want that many religions in my universe I don't want to, I don't want that um, and that's what I don't have to use them. I don't have to do anything about them. So I'm, I look down this list and I'm like, I'm pretty sure it was one of the first ones we even looked at was the syncretic Protestant pagans. Because that's something that just, I'm, to me, just sounds I'm, crazy. I'm interested. So I clicked on it and, uh, you know, they have two heresies that they're fighting about, about, you know, maybe we need to quit using technology. Maybe the best way to Anyway, um, what wound up happening after 
several hours of talking about it and you know we spread there they wound up becoming another regional hedge mong that has outposts on two planets right. and a powerful home world they're the force um, of jala gastain and uh, madri madari yeah, madari um and madari madari and gastain both have a second planet right. in them that the jala might make a play for eventually right um in the Madari sector, there's a planet called Tho that is totally having a horrible civil war right now. And then in the Gastain sector, or Hex, there's another um, planet by Shad- Shadia that has, no, 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 by Sinassus called Shadia that has a gold rush happening right now. And I'm like, no, neither of those. I don't want my. I don't want my regional he- my religious regional hegemon to also be in the middle of controlling this gold rush. That's just I think that's that's too much eggs in one basket. Um, yeah, that's that that's that plan. Okay, so so cool. That makes sense. So I got I got my second faction built. Um, the syncretic Protestant pagans. Uh, after we talked about it again. The, the pagan part of it, you know, they worship the Trinity and the the Protestant pagan part of it. We, we got to talking about the fact that my randomly generated sector name is Hades Theta. And I want that to mean something. So I get on and, I'm, and I, I looked up Hades on Wikipedia and I read all the stuff about Hades and Cerberus and the River Styx and all of this, you know, mythological stuff that I sort of knew about already. You know, it's part of my cultural heritage, I guess. Um, but to get into it and know that I want to try to incorporate some of this into my campaign is different. Um, I wound up filling a whole notebook page full of stuff that I thought was interesting. Um, we were just talking about it before this. Um, and then I look up Theta, because you know I kind of know what Theta is, but I looked it up, and it's the eight let- eighth letter of the Greek alphabet. It is marked by the symbol of death, and it was frequently a- associated with the human skull. And I'm like, holy crap, that is awesome. Um, so I have all this stuff about Greek mythology, and I'm like, all right, well, maybe these Protestant pagans, um, you know, they have this tomb world. It has all this old, awesome technology. They have this uh, pre-tech cultists. Maybe these pre-tech cultists are worshipping some weird AI, and then that they think is like the embodiment of their god. And then I put their pagans. So maybe there's like the whole pantheon of Greek gods in this AI, and was it you came up with the idea of it just being the three of them, didn't you? I did. So I did. Go I ahead. set it up. Um, I came up with the idea of it being because uh, we're still sticking with this idea of this Greek mythology. So we ended up settling on uh, Ares, Aphrodite, and Hephaestus, um, and they're actually these three. AI that are caught in the same system, uh, the same program, the same like uh, server network, and they're constantly arguing with each other because in Greek mythology, Aphrodite is married to Hephaestus, who is the forge god, and she constantly has affairs with everybody. But she, out of the gods, she truly she favors uh, Ares. They too have this little love affair all the time. And Hephaestus constantly is catching them in this this never-ending love affair that they have back and forth, and it's this huge, big ordeal. So I decided that that would be interesting if we made the three of them, um, those three characters, because they would have this constant bickering and this back and forth between these three AIs that are just caught in this server. And um, the followers that follow these are... Each one is a, is almost a little sub-faction unto itself. They're followers of a certain one of the AIs, the Ares, the Aphrodite, or the uh, Hephaestuses, if you will. Right. So, in play, I don't know that I want to just 
call them Ares, Hephaestus, and Aphrodite straight up. Right. But I, I decided that for the sake of the religion, which, you know, maybe someday my players will actually meet whatever box the artificial intelligence is in. Um, but for the sake of the religion, which they will definitely meet followers of this religion, um, they will either be on the path of beauty, on the path of brawn, or on the path of brilliance. Each one of those paths represented by one of these three AIs. And I just thought the whole thing was really interesting that they could still, we could talk about the Trinity, which is sort of a knock on Christian religion, sorry. Um, <laughs> But we can talk about the Trinity because they're Protestants, and we can talk about um, what it means for these three for these three AIs to be stuck together, and all of these people trying to find, you know, their meaning of life out of these three quarrelsome AIs. So I just thought that whole thing was cool. Um, so there now I have a second faction, and this faction is really interesting to me. I hope that my players think that it's interesting, so they'll engage with it. But if they don't, that's fine. Hopefully my universe will have other things in it that I think are interesting. So now that I've established this, I go back and I look at my outposts again. And I'm like, all right, so I've got this Tomb World outpost. Maybe the Tomb World outpost can, you know, those are maybe followers of the Hephaestus, the, the Path of Brilliance. And they're here on this Tomb World seeking more brilliance, more great things. Um, and then I, I look at my other one on in, in the Madari system. I've got another outpost world on Sandhya. And I'm like, all right. Um, and I'm looking through all of these red tags. Are you? Do you have it up, brother? I do. Um, if you go down to places, the very last thing on places says decadent pleasure cathedral and something in my brain when i read that just screamed out aphrodite and i'm like all right this this outpost is totally followers of the path of beauty and bam i know i know now what this outpost on sandhya is like because i put together all of this extra stuff um so let's just go ahead and talk about the other planet in madari um, we have the Tho, or the Tho, the, the planet Tho, Madari 5. Um, it's a civil war with hostile space. And it's tech level 4, so I'm thinking maybe these people, yeah, they're at war with each other. Why is their space hostile? In my mind, their space is hostile because they're at civil war and they don't want ships flying through outer space and going, you know, if you show up, we wound up making two factions for this planet. That was the first thing I noticed when I looked at this planet. I'm like, I'm gonna have two. I'm gonna have to have two minor factions here to fight over this planet. Um, it wound up being the Victory Union and the West Solidarity, which I got right out of the uh, political groups up at the top. If you click on political groups, I found the West Solidarity and the Victory Union. They were the two at the bottom. Um, they both have... They're both xenophobic. They both have gender roles as one of their tags. Um, one cares a lot about immigration and one is bigot bigotry. Um, I don't know how I'm going to bring that in yet. But what really mattered to me was that, yeah, they have stuff in common. Which, you know, they live on the same planet. They're probably... You know, this civil war is brother versus brother, neighbor versus neighbor. You know, they, they have stuff in common, so I like that. But then I have the bourgeois autarky, autocracy um, autarky versus the rural socialists. Now, yeah, that's a war that I understand. That's a war that I have historical reference for. That's the French Revolution. That's the... You know, the socialist, I mean, that's World War II, socialism, I mean, it wasn't socialist versus, anyway, I have historical precedence in my brain to fuel what's happening on the Civil War. I'm like, cool, this planet is taken care of. 
bam, I got a civil war going on. If we'll see what happens on the faction turn, um, that's another thing we're going to do. We're going to do a faction turn on this every two or three weeks, um, depending on how quickly the the players play. And you know, it might be just once a month. It will definitely be once a month because that's how the rules dictate that we play. Um, so we'll do that. Um, so let's go on up to Aerosali has the Area 51. I know that planet. It has Area 51. That planetary government has some power. That planetary government is probably just a minor faction, but it's still definitely a faction. Um, so what the heck? I've got a frozen planet with the Area 51. How do? You, what does that mean? Okay, so the cities are under the ice. And the Area 51 is the only place where you can get through the ice out in outer space. And these human beings are stuck under this ice crust. And uh, what kind of life is that to live? I want that in my game. Um, so eventually we got around to actually looking at the list of aliens. And we wound up putting an alien on this planet even though there's no native biosphere um we put it's like a ooze jelly monster right if you've ever you know what I mean? if you've ever seen an ooze or a or a any kind of creature like that in you know right. magic the if Gathering you've ever played anything. final fantasy it's right. a flan yeah you've seen them it's they're a, out there it's a big ooze jelly monster and we we decided that they secrete their their gelatinous secretions melt the ice yeah that's so how they they, they they burrow, the they ice. burrow through the ice and create tunnels. And the people of this planet hunt them and harvest them, and that's their one of their major exports. That's this, right. uh, one of the things that they do. Right. So, bam! There's another planet and another faction. We're Cook, a cooking bit a huge chunk out of the whole side of this thing. I'm like, all right. So let's go. Let's go do these other ones on the outside. So I go down and I open up. Thorbjorg and Shuba at the bottom left. And I look at Thorbjorg first, and I'm like, all right, we got a tech level two Cold War xenophobes. I don't think they need to be a faction. Um, it's probably a, it's a bunch of dudes stuck on this cold planet fighting with each other on the brink of a real war. They're at Cold War right now. And they don't like people from other planets, so let's just let that planet ex it exists. People can we can go there, we can make it a thing, right? But it's there's, it doesn't feel I don't feel that there's a faction there because they what, right. why do they, what do they care about the rest of the world? They don't. Right. So why do they need to be a faction? They don't is what I came up on it, I guess. Eventually, one of the other factions might become interested in that planet. Exactly, and then but then it becomes a thing. Eventually, my player characters might need to go get something from, from those planet. people, those 19th century people, right. and take it to another planet. But so maybe maybe it belongs to someone in the Shuba sector. So let's go look at the Shuba sector. Um, so I bring up Shuba. There's two planets here. Uh, I've got I've got local tech specialty. All right, but they're only tech level four. So what are the, what is this planet really good at making that like better than anyone else in the whole sector? Because I've already I know I've got a space yard that that's their specialty. Um, I know I've got some tech level five planets. Maybe these guys are weapon specialists. Maybe these guys are robotics specialists. Maybe they're software engineers. Um, I'm not sure yet. So then I go and I look down at the other planet, Pero, and I'm like, oh, they have a eugenic cult. So, and these two planets are not very close to any other planet. So maybe Rana makes some type of cybernetic enhancements, artificial limbs, artificial eyes, um, you know, robotic legs stuff like that that this eugenics cult 
just is very interested in. And when I thought that, the first, almost the first words out of my mouth were Repo Man. You know, if you if you've seen the the musical Repo Man, um, I think that sums up these two planets fairly well. Um, and again, yeah, I want to see what my players do when they come into this Repo Man solar system and have to try and deal with these people. Um, yeah, so so there's another faction. The it wound up becoming the Zhao Yin, uh, Zhao Yin Robotics Corporation, that is the best robotics company in the whole sector, and then Paro is just sort of an offshoot of that. Um, I think they're just a major faction. Uh, they're just a major faction. Um, so then I go and I look two sectors over, and there's Anita. All and I'm her, like, all by her lonesome. All alone out in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, all right, so what's this planet? Got? Oh, this is the freaking exchange consulate. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about this, um, it takes a ship six days to jump from sector to sector. That's, or not sector to sector, but hex, hex, hex. to hex. Yeah. Um, at, at level one spike drive. Technology. levels which is where our players are going to start um they have faster than light speed travel but information does not travel faster than light speed um so basically in every hex there's an um, exchange consulate satellite that is used you know if i'm in shuba and i send an email to a Ad adoni um, it's going to take, if there's a ship on the way, it's going to ping to that satellite, or really, it's going to hit the exchange consulate satellite in Shuba. Then a ship is going to come by and pick it up, and in the next sector, it's going to hit the exchange, it's going to jump from that ship to another exchange satellite. Then that ship is going to go to another sector, so the exchange satellite is going to hit the information back to it it's going to jump every sector it has to jump from a ship to an exchange consulate until it finds a ship that's going in the direction that data wants to be going in so right. it might take two weeks it might take two months for your email to actually get where it's supposed to be um which is why in this game it's very important to take notes taking notes about when your players send emails and voicemails to other people is important. You can make phone calls if you're in sec if you're in the same hex. hex as another character, but if you're not in the same hex, it's going to take at least a week before they get that information. So, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. So, anyway, back to this Roshni. So, I look at Roshni. Um, I have a Badlands world and the exchange consulate is there. And I'm like, "All right. It's way out in the middle of nowhere." Um, during the screen or during the silence after the scream, um, there's no way there would have been enough food brought here to take care of hundreds of thousands of inhabitants, and the the local biosphere is immiscible, which means you know if humans eat it, they have a horrible allergic reaction. Um, it is not consumable by human beings, so they were they were probably before the scream, they were importing all of their food via jump gate. And then the scream happens and they don't have a jump gate anymore. So maybe the hundreds of thousands of inhabitants on this planet died. And the exchange consulate still functions. I want to put enough, like, I like artificial intelligence. I like the whole thing. So I decide that I want to put another artificial intelligence on this planet and nobody else in the rest of the sector knows that the exchange consulate is run by an artificial intelligence they all think um, human beings are running it like it used to be uh, but this artificial intelligence is running it and has populated the planet with androids from the Zhao Yin company on Shuba 
and like I just imagine you know when my if my players ever come here they're going to be on you know downtown utopia main street what did i write hold on let me get the other thing up what did i write because i really i like the way i wrote it even um what's the name of that planet you have it up roshni um yeah it's a utopia android city 1950 america android utopia but my players don't know that it's androids it's just a big farce right. to show off worlders it's pleasantville so that, if you've ever seen the yeah, film pleasantville it, exactly it's your classic idealistic what people were selling it's the american dream this planet is the american dream but it's androids and none of it's real and it's all run by this artificial intelligence that maintains the and so many cool satellites things, all over the sector. So many cool things could happen. So many cool oh, things yeah. could happen on this planet. They could totally, the players could try, maybe they'll care about these people, and try to get all of these androids sentient. And then you'll have yeah. hundreds of thousands of sentient androids that are self-aware. And then all of a sudden this faction is completely different and they'll have their own faction. And it right. could totally change the flow of all these interesting things that are happening. Like they're totally regional hedge mongs close enough to this that they could eventually come and try to take over the exchange consulate. Um, right now, the exchange consulate is just going to stay as a peaceable kingdom. Um, I went ahead and made Anita, the artificial intelligence robot that controls the exchange consulate. I made that AI its own regional hedge mong that controls this whole sector of space, this whole big empty sector of space down here um i'm excited to see if another faction will ever try and pick a fight with her or if she'll try and spread her little fingers out through the rest of the sector through right. some stealthy means right it could, it could be interesting to see how uh how it all plays out <laughs>